My name's Maxine Benieba Clark, and I'm a writer. It's been a long journey between wanting to say something like that and standing here. Once upon a time, I was just a kid who read a lot. You know the kind of child I mean. We come in different shapes and colors and sizes, and we're brewing different dreams. But I was a kid who read in libraries. Look anywhere and you'll find me. Softened by life's bruises, seen or unseen, half-chewed sandwiches would hit the back of our heads at break time, and cruel, clever nicknames would well our eyes with tears. The kids who read in libraries. We were picked last for tunnel ball, booted from the football fields, and even now, some 30 years on, our psyches and our hearts still keen under the weight of childhood scars, salted by grown-ups who could never understand why we couldn't just toughen up. We longed for other worlds, and there in the library they were, brand new lives, just there for the living, and live them we did. One by one, we slayed the giants and defied the witch. We climbed out tower windows or grew dreadlocks long enough to rope down to our princess or prince, who was always, of course, just waiting for us to butterfly somewhere in the darkened wings. I climbed hopeful beanstalks. I stole gold-laying hens. I was brave enough to eat the porridge I knew belonged to bears. <laughs> I became the eighth member of Anne M. Martin's Babysitter's Club. <laughs> I was black like Jessie, but I was Claudia's best buddy. Because Claudia was the artist, so Claudia would make me over. Claudia would paint me new. The library let me become everyone I wanted to be. But eventually, I started to realize I wanted to be me. Because in all of those stories, on all of those pages, I never saw anything like my story breathe. The Australian-born child of black migrants living on another's black colonized country just trying to find a way to be. I started to realize none of those other kids reading in the library would ever read about someone like me, because my story was unwritten to borrow, or date stamp, or check out, or return. So slowly, the kid who read in the library became the kid sitting in the library desperate to be read. Time marched on as it can, and it was all about the Western canon by grade 10. We were reading Shakespeare, George Orwell, Aldous Huxley, Jane Austen, and all of them taught me things about characterization, about structure, about dedication, about intrigue. But what reading only this canon taught me was that real writers, they weren't people like me. They didn't look like me. They didn't talk like me. They didn't sound like me. They didn't live like me. And besides, even if I wrote my story down, who would really want to know? We had a handful of powerful black books at home, but they were all written by people who lived way across the ocean. We lived in Australia, and at that time, Australia seemed like a very long way from anything. This wasn't the internet age. You couldn't just Google up your history, African, Australian writer, and there would be your destiny. But I read a book by an artist called Melina Marchetta, called Looking for Alabrandi. The book was about an Italian-Australian girl. Her family was nothing like mine, and she was nothing like me. 
Second, I stumbled on a book by Sally Morgan called My Place. This book was about an Aboriginal Australian family. It was about race and history and unbelonging. Her family was nothing like mine. Her story was nothing like mine, and she was nothing like me. But together, these two authors made me believe that one day I could be what I couldn't see. This story is for all the kids who read in libraries, for all the kids like me, because what did fairy tales teach us? If not, that we need to believe. After school, I enrolled in a creative writing degree. Mine was the only black face in the faculty. In first year, we read Gertrude Stein, Andre Breton, William Faulkner, and Harper Lee, and once more, I found my salvation in the library. On these shelves, there were black writers with names I'd never heard before. Maya Angelou, Alice Walker, Nikki Giovanni, and Jean Binterbrees. These fierce black women, they wore words like crowns. They tapped out rhythms that made me understand what it was to breathe. And once more, I thought, maybe one day this could be me. We all know the story. And I could build paper forts to the horizon with all the rejection letters that said, your story is not for me. But where there's a will, there's a way. And when the path is not clear, you start to search for something that will approximate as pavers. For me, that was the microphone. For me, that was the stage. In cafes, in libraries, all over Australia, this tiny revolution was brewing. Decades after it had swept the rest of the world by storm, slam poetry had arrived in Australia. Wordsmiths would gather on the weekend to stand and testify, and I took the spoken word like flying. It was speaker's corner easy. Anyone could come. You'd grab the microphone for three minutes and you'd let rip poetry. When the audience liked something, they would click their fingers, they'd murmur, and they'd stamp their feet. It was this extraordinary act of literary democracy. We had circumvented the gatekeepers and gone straight to the people and, well, what if the people liked you? For five years, I lived this kind of poetry, around life, around love, around work, around other things. But the thing about dreams is the closer you come to one, the more you want it. And I did. I was staying up late at night, just the darkness, words, and me, writing and rewriting, writing and rewriting, and trying to find a way to believe. I sent manuscripts from this end of the country to that end of the country. I posted poems to lit journals in London and New York City. But this is how my first poetry collection came to be. There was going to be a competition it would be held in local libraries across my state. The final would be held at our State Writers' Festival. And the prize? The prize was a poetry publishing deal. They called this competition Poetry Idol. And I thought, how could that not be me? I entered and very enthusiastically won the heat and it felt like the prize was mine. This felt like one for the kid who read in the library. I don't quite know how I was disqualified. <laughs> maybe I ran over time, maybe I was so nervous I repeated a poem that I read in the heat. All I know was I was left standing on stage with my heart broken, blinking. And I don't know what it was that made me phone the publisher the very next day. Maybe hopefulness and maybe desperation. I told him he had missed out on publishing my book. It was a travesty for me, but more so for him. <laughs> there was a pause on the other end of the phone. 
probably while he tried to ascertain just how crazy I was. And then he said something unexpected. He said, I've got five minutes. Read me something, please. I opened my notebook, and this is what I read. This is for the kids who read in libraries. We come in different shapes and colors and sizes, and we all have different dreams. But there are kids who read in libraries. Look anywhere and you'll find me. One month later, we published a 40-page poetry sampler. One year later, we published a full collection. Three years after that, a second. And I'm now the author of eight books across four different genres. <laughs> my work is taught on the school syllabus in my home state, and I make a living as the poet laureate for a national newspaper. This story is for all the kids who read in libraries, for all the kids like me. And this story is for all the people who take a chance and say, I have five minutes. Read me something, please. <laughs> <laughs>